You may get the impression that I am a stupid and naive husband who does not understand the true nature of his wife at all. But if you look back, everything becomes clearer. Like many happily married men, I fully trusted and loved my wife, with whom I shared eight years of intimacy and happy memories. I didn't know that the woman I adored was actually a selfish monster, or rather, one of the three. Molly's two sisters have always occupied an important place in my life, starting from our first date. The first meeting with identical triplets was both nervous and exciting. When I arrived at Molly's apartment to pick her up, I was greeted by three stunningly similar sisters. We met at the grocery store, where Molly asked me to help her reach the top shelf to buy herbal tea. Molly, who was an impressive seven feet tall, was curvaceous and voluptuous, with black hair cut short around her ears. It was only after our fourth walk that she told me that she had noticed me in the grocery department, found me attractive, and was waiting in the herbal tea department for me to come to her for help. I was very flattered by this revelation. Even more amazing was that she shared this story with me. She was lying naked in my arms when we made love for the first time. Our first dates were magical, filled with long conversations over dinner, walks in the park, feeding ducks and romantic movies where we held hands. It may be corny, but I was fascinated, bewitched by her presence. Molly was the most amazing girl I've ever met. She had a certain fascination, mesmerizing and charming, like a neighbor girl with a smile that could brighten up even the darkest day. While I was bringing her tea, she was having a friendly conversation, making me feel like the star of a movie. I was overjoyed when she agreed to go on a date with me next Friday, but I was stunned when I arrived at her house and was greeted by not one but three beautiful women who looked like Molly. One of them smiled and said, You must be Scott. I was speechless. Wait, aren't you Molly? I asked in surprise. The woman in front of me laughed. Her laugh was as charming as Molly's when we met at the supermarket. No, I'm Hannah, she replied. Actually, Molly, Amy and I are triplets. Didn't Molly mention us? I tried to remember our previous conversation, but I couldn't remember anything about the twins. Hannah laughed again and replied, Molly sometimes forgets to mention us. She played a little trick on you, but don't worry. I'll bring her in now, Hannah said and followed her. When I entered the living room, there was another Molly standing there, but it turned out to be Amy. They all had the same haircuts, shapes, and beaming smiles, and I couldn't tell them apart until Molly came out of one of the bedrooms and greeted me with an offer of herbal tea. Our conversation at dinner covered a wide range of topics, but we devoted a lot of time to Molly's life in the three. I was intrigued and eager to learn all about their unique bond. Does she like to constantly see her reflection in the faces of her sisters? Was their relationship closer than that of ordinary sisters? Can they communicate almost telepathically, as they say about identical twins? Have they ever changed personalities to make fun of others? I'm not sure we can read each other's minds, Molly shared, but we're incredibly close. I think I can almost always predict what Amy or Hannah are thinking and they often do the same thing, like answering a question before I even ask it. It's always been like this with us. When it comes to deceiving others, she paused and grinned. I think we have succeeded a little bit in this. Have you noticed that we all have similar hairstyles? I nodded, encouraging her to continue. When we were little, we liked to deceive people, teachers, relatives, even our own parents. Surprisingly, they couldn't tell us apart. It was very funny, especially when Amy or Hannah got into trouble and tried to avoid punishment. No, Dad, I'm not Amy. I'm Molly, she said with a grin. It was a comical situation that drove Mom and Dad to the brink of insanity. When we started high school, we all wanted individuality. We were tired of being constantly confused with each other, so we changed our hairstyles, went to different classes, and participated in different events. For example, I was a member of the yearbook team, Amy participated in the newspaper issue, and Hannah played tennis. But over time, we found that we couldn't easily switch roles. Therefore, we resorted to external similarity. Sometimes I would fill in for Amy on the chemistry exam, or Hannah would give a talk on my behalf. It raised our grades a little bit, you know? 
She smiled. In my freshman year, Brad Hendricks once asked Amy out on a date. She was head over heels in love with him. Unfortunately, on the day of the planned date, Amy got the flu, which caused her stress. Worried that Brad would never ask her out again if she refused, she asked me to replace her. It wasn't difficult because it was their first date and they didn't know each other very well. From the second date, Amy resumed control, and they continued dating for almost a year. He never found out that I was her understudy. Years later I remembered it with bitterness. But at that moment a sweet, cheerful and charming girl was sitting in front of me. I was already in love with her, and the fact that she seemed to have the same feelings for me was just wonderful. All three girls went to college and enjoyed their independence, but they missed each other very much. So, after graduating from college, the three of them returned to Cincinnati and settled into a spacious apartment. It was here that I came to pick up Molly for our date, where I also had the pleasure of meeting her sisters. Molly and I dated, fell in love, and two years later tied the knot. I felt like the happiest person in the world, having a job at a graphic design firm. Because I had more experience with computers than the older men who did it, I was considered a valuable employee and earned a good income. This has allowed us to comfortably purchase a lovely three-bedroom house in Oakley Square, just a short walk from our downtown office. Unsurprisingly, among our neighbors were Amy and her husband Ted, a tall but very boring man who worked in the financial sector. Although Ted was friendly, he wasn't interesting. They were our neighbors who lived at the end of Ferdinand Place, a small, dead-end street. Amy and Ted's lot overlooked the backyard of the house on Oak Park Place where Hannah and her husband Arnold lived. Arnold, also known as Arnie, was very different from Ted. He was older than us, a cheerful man who owned several bowling alleys in Cincinnati. He smoked cigars until Hannah convinced him to quit. He could tell funny, sometimes risky jokes and was always great company. They tied the knot a few months earlier than Amy and Ted. It came as no shock to any of us husbands that our wives insisted on living so close to each other. They were almost like Siamese triplets, always together and finishing each other's sentences as if they were one. Ted, Barney and I are already used to their synchronized conversations and shared thoughts. We were already used to the fact that every evening the triplets gathered together to chat before going to bed. They would gather in one of our three kitchens at about 21.30 p.m. or 22 p.m., start a conversation, and then go home to their husbands. Even though I lived with Molly for eight years, I was never able to determine with certainty which of the triplets was which, and even Ted and Arnie were struggling with the same problem. Over time, we learned to recognize each wife by her clothes or accessories, for example, by a certain necklace or earrings. When we celebrated Christmas with their parents, Pam and Donald, it became obvious that it was as difficult for us to distinguish their daughters from each other as it was for them. But despite the similarities, each sister had her own unique traits. Amy looked more restrained and traditional compared to her sisters, demonstrating a slightly more rigid and conservative style of behavior. Hannah was more sociable and adventurous often drank alcohol and used risky humor. She seemed the most likely candidate for a career as a topless bar dancer among the three sisters, although I highly doubt she ever thought about it. Molly occupied an intermediate position, embodying qualities that made her both nicer and more sociable than Amy, and at the same time, more balanced than Hannah. This is not to say that the differences between the sisters were not obvious during our communication, Rather, it was difficult to distinguish them only by appearance or speech. In another sense, it can be formulated as follows. When they tried to deceive us, we didn't have a single chance of success. Since none of us had children at that time, planning a vacation was a piece of cake. Molly and her sisters insisted that the six of us go on vacation together. Therefore, every summer we allocated two weeks for trips to such interesting places as Las Vegas a beach resort in North Carolina or Italy. Fortunately, we all got along well with each other, so the husbands didn't mind. Every year I made it a rule to go away with Molly for a week, 
just the two of us, without Amy, Hannah, and the brothers-in-law. At first, this caused conflicts, led to heated arguments and cold silence. It took several attempts before Molly finally realized that I was adamant in my decision. It was only three years later that everything fell into place. I love spending time with your sisters and enjoy talking to Arnie and Ted, but I really wish we could be alone. Is it really that hard to understand? Here's what we'll do. You will ride for two weeks with all of us every year, and I will ride for one week only with you. I've repeated this speech countless times, but it wasn't until the day before our trip to Italy, when Molly came home from work and realized I hadn't even started packing, that she finally gave up. That's when the argument started. I stood my ground, insisting that if she didn't agree to spend a week with me, then I would just stay at home while she and two other couples went to Italy. The heated arguments went on for over an hour, and I refused to budge while Amy and Hannah took numerous phone calls from Molly. Despite their attempts to calm me down, I remained adamant. They tried to convince me that I was being selfish and stubborn, but I stood my ground. In the end, Molly agreed to my terms, and we went on a trip to Italy. At first, there was an atmosphere of coldness between us for several days. Fortunately, Arnie and Ted gave me the necessary support, secretly rejoicing at my success, because it meant that they could count on similar treatment from their wives. Encouraging myself, I did not give up. I did not give in to the impulse to interrupt the trip and return home. By the fifth day, the charm of Florence had affected Molly, and the rest of our trip was simply extraordinary, just like our week on Sanibel Island next winter. After that, every year we spent two wonderful weeks with Molly's sisters and one wonderful week without them. It all seemed perfect, didn't it? And so it was. But the problem arose when we decided to start a family. Molly and I knew that one day we would want to have children, but we enjoyed spending time alone or alone with two other couples too much to rush into parenthood. When she and her sisters turned 30 and I turned 32, the ticking of the biological clock became more obvious. She decided to stop taking birth control pills, and soon after that, Molly and I started trying to conceive a child. I had no doubts about the idea itself, or how it would be implemented. I've always enjoyed making love to my wonderful wife, our intimate moments were most often tender and much less often wild and rude. Over the years, the playful and creative nights we enjoyed together have become less frequent, a common occurrence for married couples. Molly surprised me from time to time with her excitability and aggressiveness in bed, which led to numerous rounds of passionate intercourse. Champagne has always been a must-have attribute for special occasions, which further enhanced her desire. Despite this, our intimacy was mostly tender and loving, and I cherished this dynamic very much. After she started sexually harassing me one night, I decided to defuse the situation by joking about it. To my surprise, she didn't find it funny at all. On Saturday evening, I returned from the grocery store to have dinner, and I heard her calling my name from the bedroom. When I entered, I saw that she was lying on the bed undressed and holding a bottle of massage oil in her hands. I'm feeling a little tense today, cowboy, she said softly. Could you give me a massage? I gladly agreed and worked on her back and legs, making her moan with pleasure. It was a surprisingly intimate moment between us. We made passionate love until I reached a state of pure bliss. We lay together for a while, enjoying the aftertaste. Then, Molly went to the kitchen to bring us a snack, as we had missed dinner. Before we knew it, we were back in each other's arms. When we took a deep breath and exchanged smiles, I couldn't help but exclaim, Wow, Molly, that was incredible! I pretended to think for a moment before speaking. Maybe you're not Molly after all. Are you Amy or Hannah? Molly has never seemed so excited. She seemed to realize that I was joking, but instead of smiling or responding playfully, she looked at me sternly. Scott, this is not a joke. How could you even imagine that I could do something like that? Do you really think that I would ever consider setting you up with my sisters? When she gave me a piercing look, 
The room suddenly became at least 10 degrees colder. Molly, please forgive me, I apologized hastily. I was just joking, honey. I tried to hug her but she recoiled and stood up. I'm going to take a shower, she said, and her anger became palpable as she disappeared into the bathroom and closed the door behind her. For the rest of the evening and most of the next day, I felt like I was invisible to her. Molly insisted that some topics were unacceptable for jokes. Eventually, during Sunday dinner, I apologized again, repeating that my comment was a joke. She seems to have calmed down a bit. Later that evening she let me snuggle up to her in bed and I felt relieved. I didn't like that Molly was offended by me, and I reminded myself that in the future I shouldn't look down on the replacement sisters, although I found her violent reactions somewhat funny. During our first date, she shared with me the story of how she switched Amy on a date with a high school student. This memory surfaced a few weeks before our wedding during a disagreement with Molly over some trivial matter for example, which hotel to stay in during our honeymoon in Curacao. Yielding to her choice, I jokingly suggested that if she didn't want me, then maybe I would marry one of her sisters. She replied playfully, I don't think they'll accept you, dear. Amy and Hannah don't sleep well and I mentioned your periodic snoring. For them this can be a decisive factor. You'd better stay with me. Disappointed, I replied, Well, if I can't get Amy or Hannah then I guess I'll settle for you. That was the end of our playful banter. Years later, I was puzzled when she got upset about the same joke. As already mentioned, the birth of a child, or rather our attempts to conceive a child, completely changed my life. We tried for about 10 months and enjoyed the process. I've heard that it may take some couples a year or two to get pregnant, so I wasn't too worried. But Molly began to worry that nothing was working out for us, and strongly recommended that I see a doctor to get checked out. Reluctantly, I went and took some tests, sitting in a small room with adult magazines. A few days later, I got a call which I had been looking forward to since the previous Friday while I was at work. I quickly closed the door of my office and talked with Dr. Randall for a few minutes. He reassured me by saying, Scott, there's nothing to worry about. Your sperm count is slightly below average, about 70% of what is typical for a man your age. But your sperm cells are healthy and strong, there just aren't that many of them. You and Molly should have no difficulty getting pregnant although for some couples it may take longer than expected. I was relieved to hear the news and looked forward to returning home to calm Molly down. But at dinner I completely forgot about it, as we got carried away discussing Cincinnati politics. I came to my senses only at almost 11 o'clock in the evening. That evening, the sisters gathered in our kitchen, as usual. After watching basketball on TV, I went to bed. Although I usually fell asleep before Molly arrived, thoughts about the amount of semen haunted me. Feeling the need to tell Molly immediately, I quickly put on my robe and went downstairs. Deciding to allay her worries, I interrupted the conversation in the kitchen to assure her that everything was fine. As I walked through the living room towards the kitchen, I heard the three sisters laughing loudly behind the closed swing door. Their joyful sounds made me smile, reminding me how much they value each other's company. Instead of continuing on my way, I stopped to eavesdrop on their conversation, purely out of curiosity. To be honest, it was all very funny. I just couldn't help but find out what enlivens their conversation so much. I had no idea that I would soon hear the first voice in their lively exchange of opinions. Why do you always want to change partners if they're not the best? Voice number two chuckled and explained, I didn't say Arnie wasn't the best, he's just not as good at petting as Scott. Voice number three added, You still spend more nights with Arnie than any of us, plus weekends. So you probably shouldn't complain about your situation. The room filled with laughter, and I stood there, completely stunned. To say that I couldn't believe what I heard would be an understatement, I was at a loss. The idea that they had affairs with each other's husbands was just shocking. I sat down quietly, trying to make sense of it all, and overheard the conversation. It's been almost a year, and I've started to doubt Scott's ability to handle the task. Do you have a backup plan? Yes, if the semen analysis does not improve. 
He passed the test about a week ago so we'll find out soon. How should we do this? It's not a problem. I'm just going to spend a few nights with Ted when I'm ovulating. It's getting a little monotonous to be with Scott every night. And when everything gets better at the end of the cycle, I want to spend a couple of nights with Arnie. But remember, Molly. This is not a guaranteed plan. You won't see Arnie again until you get pregnant. Laughter rang out. My shock has not yet turned into anger. I was trying to accept the only logical conclusion I could come to after learning about Molly's intentions. She planned to carry her child with Ted. Despite the fact that Ted was slightly taller than me by three, four inches, we had the same hair, eye color, and body type. Arnie, on the other hand, was shorter and heavier, and stood out from us. I was frozen in an armchair in the dimly lit living room, gripped by fear at the realization that my once happy marriage was coming to an end. I tried to collect my thoughts, but I realized that the casual conversation in the kitchen was over. I slipped noiselessly into the bedroom, ducked under the covers, and lay motionless. Even in a state of shock, I knew I had to approach Molly with caution. Besides, I couldn't predict which of the sisters would join me. I took a deep breath and relaxed, pretending to be asleep, when a few minutes later one of the sisters climbed into bed. I felt a gentle kiss on my cheek and heard her whisper, I love you baby, as Molly often did before going to bed. Despite the anger and betrayal boiling inside me, I forced myself to remain calm and composed resisting the urge to lash out at her with accusations of infidelity to my two brothers-in-law. Instead, I lay quietly, controlling my breathing and digesting the painful truth. I waited patiently for her to fall asleep, and a plan was already forming in my head. It wasn't long before Molly's breathing became slow and even. Nevertheless, I stayed in bed for another hour, wanting to make sure she was really asleep, before making my move. When I was thinking about how they could switch husbands without anyone noticing, it dawned on me that it was very simple. Given their joint role as store managers specializing in interior design, dressing up during evening meetings would be an inconspicuous way to implement their plan. None of them left the house in the morning before Arnie, Ted, and me. Changing clothes in the morning was easy, the only potential problem was weekends. I assumed that either we would spend time with our wives on weekends, or they would agree to switch days. But it was quite feasible, considering that the six of us had a barbecue brunch or some kind of party almost every weekend. And if not, then I quickly go to my sister to pick up the catalog that she has prepared for me, using another excuse if necessary. It wasn't difficult to figure out how it was done, but why? One could only guess. One would think that husbands are able to distinguish their wife from another woman, but we had no reason to be suspicious. I didn't doubt the identity of the woman lying in my bed, at least I didn't doubt it before. But somehow, I noticed something else. In the early days of our marriage, Molly and I could lie in bed for hours and talk about everything our relationship, future plans, work, family, but everything has changed. I'm not sure exactly when it happened, but a few years ago, Molly started avoiding late night conversations. After spending time with her sisters, she would come into the bedroom and we would just go to bed. Regardless of whether we had an intimate relationship or not, any attempts to start a conversation were thwarted by a tired response. Let's talk about it tomorrow, dear. Throughout all these years, our meaningful conversations about our days and plans for the future have always taken place over dinner or earlier, and never late at night in bed. It seems to have been a well-thought-out strategy, as women often changed partners. The less they talked, the less likely it was that his wife would be caught off guard or forget something. After making sure that Molly was asleep, I quietly entered the office found the ink pad that we used to write down our checking accounts, and smeared my finger with indelible black ink. Back in the bedroom, I carefully placed a tiny mark on her back. It was located on the right side, halfway between the shoulder blade and shoulder. 
She was no bigger than a pencil eraser and barely noticeable unless she was looking at her back in the mirror. I went to the bathroom to wash my finger with warm soap and water, but found that the ink was stubbornly eating into the skin. Despite the fact that I diligently washed them off, only part of the ink dispersed. I continued to scratch my finger with the pumice stone until the remaining trace became dim and imperceptible. When I crawled back under the covers, I had a bitter smile on my lips. The initial shock passed, leaving behind a simmering anger. The words the women exchanged flashed through my mind, painting a picture of betrayal and deception. It seemed that Molly had long ago organized a betrayal against me, putting her connection with her sisters above her obligations to me. Realizing this, I felt manipulated, betrayed, and completely humiliated. I racked my brain for a solution, but nothing came to mind. It seemed impossible to fix the situation. There was a barbecue at Ted's house on Saturday afternoon. While the women were cooking, Ted was busy at the grill. I took the opportunity to ask Arnie if he wanted to take a walk around the block. Mindful of his weight, he gladly agreed to exercise. When we were safely away from home, I asked Arnie if he wanted to talk about something personal for a few minutes. Of course, Scott, what did you want? I replied, first of all, can we keep this conversation strictly between us? I wouldn't want Molly, Hannah, Amy, or Ted to find out about this. If someone asks, let's say that we discussed possible travel plans for next summer, for example, a trip to Greece. Arnie seemed satisfied with this statement. I said, I'm a little shy to ask, but I was interested to know about your intimate relationship with Hannah. Molly and I usually make love once or twice a week, but I wish it would happen more often. I'm just wondering if her sisters have similar experiences. Arnie playfully slapped me on the back and joked, Looks like you're not so lucky, buddy. Hannah and I do this every night almost without a break. Sometimes we can miss one night because of her period, or if one of us is too exhausted. Everything else is going smoothly. He noticed the expression on my face and smiled. Chose the wrong sister, right? Well, how were you supposed to know, or any of us anyway? I think I was just lucky. Hiding the anger I felt behind a facade of disappointment, I asked, Has it always been like this, Arnie? I mean, from the very beginning of your marriage. He thought about it. Almost every evening Hannah and I had our own routine, our own little game. I would go to bed, read or watch TV by the time she returned, sitting in the kitchen with her sisters. When she entered the bedroom, she looked at me with a certain expression on her face and always said in the same seductive voice, Well, big boy, what do you want to do tonight? This is a common question before starting intimacy. It may seem silly, but as long as we enjoy each other's company, I'm not complaining. We both laughed, and I tried to diffuse the situation with another question. Molly and I used to have deep conversations in bed, talking about ourselves and our relationship. But over time, our bedroom has become mostly a place for passion and sleep. We don't talk anymore. Is Hannah like that too? We tend to leave these important relationship conversations for another time of day. Frankly, it's not that important to me. But I think it's almost like you and Molly. He chuckled slightly, mentioning that the bedroom was used for intimacy and then for sleeping. When we got back to the house, Arnie was talking mostly about the Cincinnati Bengals, his only big love besides Hannah. I tried to nod and agree at the right moments, but my thoughts were somewhere else, in a gloomy and deserted place. Anger took hold of me, but somehow I lasted the day and evening without losing my temper, although others might have noticed that I was distancing myself. I was determined to hold out for another day. After saying goodbye to Ted and Amy, I treated Molly to her favorite Indian food and tried my best to be a supportive companion for the rest of the evening. Around 10 o'clock in the evening, Molly, as usual, went to spend time with Amy and Hannah. When she returned and we were getting ready for bed, I went up to her and gently stroked her neck and shoulders in search of ink marks. They weren't there. I realized that it was finally over. You, whoever you are, it's time for you and your sisters to face the consequences. Darling, I asked, 
How is your scratch on your leg? Let me take a look. She stiffened slightly. A scratch? She asked cautiously. Yes, you hit the dishwasher door after dinner last night, I replied, bending down to examine her leg. Oh, that, she said dispassionately. It's all right. There's not even a trace left. Yes, I agree, I replied, carefully examining the leg. There are no tracks here now. Surprisingly, it used to look disgusting. When I straightened up, I noticed how relieved she was. I went into the bathroom to brush my teeth and was pleased with myself. There was no trace of the scratch, and her reaction convinced me that the woman present in my bedroom today was different from the one who was yesterday. A few minutes later I was lying in bed and impatiently waiting for her to join me after coming out of the bathroom. Honey, I greeted her, let's continue today as we did yesterday, it was incredible. She looked at me with a note of wariness and asked, What do you mean, dear? I reminded her of the previous evening when she came in with a mischievous twinkle in her eyes and asked, Well, big boy, how do you want me today? I couldn't resist and replied, Well, it would be nice to pay tribute to my manhood. Then you gently pushed me back onto the bed, caressing and teasing me until you drove me crazy. It was an incredible experience. Do you remember that? Molly looked shocked for a moment, and then a worried expression appeared on her face as she thought about it. Of course I remember, dear. I'm just not sure I'm ready for something so intense tonight. Okay, I replied. Let's do everything slowly and carefully today if that's what you want. But could you share with me those words that you said last night? She climbed into bed and wrapped her arms around me, pulling me to her so that her face was hidden. Of course, honey, she whispered. I'll say whatever you want. I just like making you happy. What kind of things did you like? I laughed softly. You're not going to get off that easy. Well, you know, just those sweet words that you whispered to me while we were studying. She was silent while we caressed each other. I was very turned on, despite the fact that I was angry. Surprisingly, Molly seemed to be struggling to get in the right mood. My usual affectionate gestures did not inflame her at all. Worried, I pulled away and began to watch her closely. Is everything all right, dear? I asked innocently. Meeting my gaze, she replied. I'm sorry, Scott. I think I'm just tired and my stomach is upset, most likely because of the spicy food. Let's make love, but please don't expect me to be wild and crazy again today, okay? I assured Molly that we could proceed slowly and carefully. We can save the passion for another time. She kissed me gratefully. After this conversation, events unfolded quite naturally, the usual pleasant intimacy between spouses, as has happened more than once with my wife Molly. At least, I always thought it was my wife Molly. But on Sunday, everything changed for the worse. All three couples agreed to have lunch at Trentino, our favorite place, and then get together at Arnie and Hannah's. The men watched the Bengals game, and the sisters spent the day chatting and laughing together. In the morning, I kept a close eye on Molly so that she would not contact her sisters before our scheduled meeting. I noticed her anger because she believed that my partner in bed on Friday had not properly informed her about the scratch on her leg or about the intimate relationship they had with me. When we sat down at the Trentino restaurant and ordered drinks, Molly quickly asked her sister Hannah to go to the bathroom with her, and they quickly left the table. Molly looked furious and depressed, and Hannah looked a little embarrassed. They reappeared a few minutes later, both looking pale and worried. They had difficulty holding their drinks and seemed to be trying to focus on the conversation. They tried not to look me in the eye, but I could feel their intense gazes on me when I looked away. It was obvious that Molly held Hannah responsible for not telling her about what had happened between her and me the night before. Since Hannah said that there was nothing like that, both of them began to feel a sense of anxiety. Amy, however, seemed unperturbed at first, chatting cheerfully with her sisters and with us. In the end, she also caught the tense atmosphere. When we were finishing eating eggs Benedict, salmon omelette and Belgian waffles, Amy casually asked Hannah to check on her problematic contact, 
subtly hinting at hidden anxiety. When they returned a few minutes later, three pale and tense sisters were sitting at the table. They avoided looking me in the eye and were silent during our conversation. Their restlessness and anxiety persisted throughout the day, much to my satisfaction. While Ted, Arnie, and I were happy that the Bengals had finally won the match, the girls stayed at home in the background. They were silent for three hours without saying a word. When it came time to say goodbye, my sisters-in-law avoided looking into each other's eyes while we exchanged hugs. It was quiet at dinner in our house, but I tried to lighten the mood by telling Molly funny jokes about work and the upcoming vacation. She forced a smile and answered only briefly. It was obvious that she was nervous. All evening, while we were cleaning the kitchen and watching TV, I pretended that everything was fine. I watched Molly with a sense of horror and anxiety. When the clock struck 9.15 p.m., she said, Honey, I'm going to visit Hannah for a while, okay? Of course, dear. In your absence, I can start packing my things and loading them into the car. I will arrange a truck to transport furniture and other things at the end of this week, I replied. Her complexion paled. Scott, what do you mean? Why do you need to pack your things? I replied dispassionately. Well, of course I'm leaving. Do you really think that I will stay in the house with a lying, unfaithful person? She was panting, looking at me in shock. Darling, I don't understand, she stuttered. I just stared at her, drowning out her words. She knew what I meant, but she couldn't find the right words to answer. I'll see you when you get back, I said, and headed for the stairs. No, Scott, please wait, she screamed, her voice shaking, but I ignored her and continued to pack my things. I had a feeling that she would contact her sisters first, and I was right. A few minutes later, Molly appeared at the entrance to the bedroom and said softly, Honey, Amy and Hannah are downstairs. Can you talk to us? She looked upset, with tears on her cheeks and smeared makeup, radiating a sense of fear and sadness. In that fleeting moment, I felt sorry for her. Yes, I replied, looking away. I'll be down soon. I hurriedly searched the room for my compact digital voice recorder a device I often use to take notes on the go. I put it on the record and put it in my pocket. When I entered the kitchen, I noticed that the three sisters were already sitting at the table with tense and gloomy faces. Sitting down at the table, I looked from one interlocutor to another and asked, Well? There was a painful silence in the room. None of them seemed to want to talk. Eventually, Molly broke the tension by saying, Scott, you know how much I care about you, don't you? I replied in a cold tone. I'm sorry, but who are you from the sisters? Molly raised her voice and exclaimed, I'm Molly, your wife. Really? I replied sarcastically. Just a minute. I walked around behind her and examined her back, finding no black dots. I repeated the procedure with two other sisters, finding a mark on one of them. There was confusion on their faces and that prompted me to sit back down. Okay, I began. Just for the sake of discussion, let's assume that you're Molly. Where did you sleep on Friday night when your sister was here? I gestured to the one with the mark on her back. Did you lie in bed with me? Their eyes did not leave me, stunned by my question. Take your time, she said. I'm not in a hurry. I'm sure there's a logical explanation for why at least two or even all three of you have ended up in my bed over the past few nights. There was a long silence. Molly was crying and the other two were solemnly watching what was happening. I pretended to want to leave. I need to pack my things, I said. No, wait, Molly hastily interjected. I'll explain, I'll explain. Please, Scott, just give me a chance to make you understand, she begged. I wanted to yell at her that it was too late to explain. Then I realized that I really wanted to hear their explanations. How could the three of them justify their actions? And more importantly, will they be honest with me? I waited patiently for an answer, but Molly was too overwhelmed with tears to answer. Eventually her sister spoke up, confessing, It was just a stupid game, Scott. It started as a prank and somehow got out of control. I want to make it clear that all this was just a joke. Nothing serious. 
About a month ago, we were making fun of each other about our spouses, discussing our likes and dislikes. We were talking about intimate life, and we jokingly suggested trying to switch husbands. It may seem like a foolhardy idea now, but back then it was all a lot of fun, just a way to challenge each other. But in the following weeks, the situation escalated and became more serious than we had originally planned. Molly and Amy watched Hannah as she continued to speak. The events took place on Friday evening. We changed in the kitchen before heading to each other's house. Amy with you, Molly with Arnie, and I with Ted. The next day we changed clothes again at the barbecue. Looking back, we all realize how stupid our act was, and we understand that you are angry about it. Please give Molly a chance to make things right. She really loves you. Just look at how unhappy she is, she pleaded, pointing at her crying sister. Let me clarify the situation. Amy was with me, and Molly was with Arnie. Everyone nodded in agreement. I turned to Amy wanting to know the truth. So, Amy, how was it? How does our closeness relate to your past experience with Ted? Amy looked shocked by the question. I am... it was... I don't know, Scott. It was really great, she admitted hesitantly. Really? I continued. Yes, it's really great, she confirmed. Could you remind me how great it is? How did we do it? What really happened? Amy avoided eye contact. To be honest, I can't remember. It was only a couple of nights ago, for the first time during your marriage. You and one of your sisters switched husbands and you can't remember what happened. Do you have the first signs of Alzheimer's disease or something like that? I looked at Hannah. Nice try, Hannah, but your story is complete nonsense. Yes, it was Amy in my bed. On Friday evening when she was sleeping, I put a black ink mark on her back. Despite this, we did not enter into an intimate relationship. I am not naive enough to believe that this was an isolated incident, and I refuse to be deceived by your lies. I know perfectly well that you three have recognized Arnie as the most skilled in bed. I could see the shock on their faces, but I continued. And don't think for a second that I don't know that he has a different partner every night of the week. One of you three and I visit less than twice a week. But I get a small reward, right? I have the opportunity to touch your most intimate area whenever you want. I paused, waiting for their reaction. Molly was crying uncontrollably, and her sisters were stoically watching what was happening. I was already impatient, but I wanted them to confess. You have another chance, I said. I'm demanding the truth again, this time specifically from Molly. How long have you been cheating on me with your sister's husbands? Molly, with red eyes and a pleading expression, hesitated before finally confessing, It's been many years since Hannah and Arnie got married. There was a tense silence in the room as I waited for an answer. Hannah added, Molly's not entirely to blame. Amy and I insisted on it, but it only happened occasionally. I asked, What's next? No one wanted to answer. So, it started happening more and more often, Amy admitted. So, the three of you began to regularly share three husbands, as in a small round dance? Molly nodded sadly. And when did it turn into seven nights a week for Arnie and casual hookups for me? Molly didn't answer me or look me in the eye. How many nights did you spend with Arnie every week? She muttered. One or two. Disappointed, I exclaimed that I had already heard enough and did not see the point in continuing to listen. She tried to explain that it was just a contact, begging me not to let it affect our love for each other. And pregnancy has nothing to do with it either, I think. She was panting, and her sisters looked worried. Scott, what's wrong with you? What is it? She asked. Do you think I didn't know that you were planning to get pregnant with Ted? because you thought I was incapable? I sighed. No, Scott, she said, and got up and walked around the table to hug me. I stood up and pushed her away, causing her to trip over the refrigerator. You despicable woman, don't ever touch me again. You betrayed me in every possible way that a wife can betray her husband with the help of her two slutty sisters. Now the three of you can leave Arnie and Ted to their fate 
unless you decide to bring another man into your vicious circle. Without waiting for their response, I rushed out of the kitchen through the swing door, grabbed my suitcase, and went out the front door. I didn't see them again, but I heard screams coming from the kitchen when I left. I spent a restless and furious night in a room at the Hyatt Hotel. The next morning, I decided to take a break from work and visit a lawyer before heading to the bank. I quickly made an appointment for lunch with Arnie and Ted, forcing Ted to cancel the previous meeting. While we were sitting in the diner and ordering sandwiches, I wasted no time getting down to business. Guys, I have some shocking news. Our wives have been cheating on us all three of them together for several years now, I said. Arnie was visibly stunned by this revelation. Surprisingly, Ted just nodded and admitted, I had a feeling something like this was happening. I was stunned, but we both looked at him expectantly. What made you start to suspect? I asked. Ted explained that there were too many times when Amy forgot something, couldn't remember the conversations she had in the afternoon or the night before. He wasn't sure, but he decided to make sure she was forgetting before pressing charges. I thought that as soon as I have more convincing evidence, I will discuss it with you. How did you know? He asked. I recounted the conversation I overheard and then mentioned the ink trail strategy. Ted seemed lost in thought and Arnie exclaimed, Unbelievable, my God, it's unbelievable. After I finished explaining, he asked, Are you absolutely sure, Scott? It all seems so far-fetched. In response, I turned on the recording of the conversation that had taken place with the three of them the night before and let the tape speak for itself. After it was over, we exchanged gloomy glances and then began a serious conversation. Arnie and Ted called at work and said they weren't coming that day. I confessed that I was in the process of divorcing Molly, realizing that there was no turning back. Not knowing what to do next, we talked for several hours, and I realized that, oddly enough, I had never felt closer to my two sons-in-law. They were great guys and I will miss them very much. I found a suitable apartment, returned with a truck to pick up a few pieces of furniture, and officially moved in. By the end of the week I had finished taking the last things and clothes out of the house. Molly kept calling me at work and on my cell phone. I asked my assistant to reject her calls and got a new mobile number. Adding my apartment's phone number to the blacklist also turned out to be a wise decision. I started the divorce process and set about arranging my future. On Thursday, I had an unusual conversation with Barbara, a work colleague. Despite my apparent distraction and anger, she still came up to me in the office to ask what was bothering me. I reluctantly told her the whole situation, and her expression changed between surprise, sympathy, and a strange hint of satisfaction. This only fueled my disappointment, and I decided to express my annoyance to her. I'm really sorry, Scott, she replied, but I'm really disappointed in the way they treated you. She looked a little embarrassed as she spoke. It just always seemed to me that you and I could make a great couple, she admitted. I looked at her in surprise. Barbara was not only kind, generous, and humorous, but also tall and stunningly beautiful. In my heart, I always recognized her attractiveness, but my love for Molly consumed all my thoughts. But now it seemed to me that it was worth thinking about. We continued our conversation with her, keeping it confidential. Despite this, Barbara noticed that my feelings for her had changed. Molly, through my lawyer, asked for a meeting to explain everything. Despite my doubts that she could change anything, I agreed to the meeting. Six weeks after I moved in, we found ourselves alone in my lawyer's conference room. When she came in, I couldn't help but notice her beauty, even though she looked sad. I sat patiently and waited for her to take a seat. So Molly, I began, how are you feeling? Are you expecting Ted's baby already? She blushed at the question. No, Scott, she replied. I don't have a close relationship with Ted or anyone else. I only want to have a child with you. I hesitated before sharing. You know, that night when I overheard you talking in the kitchen, 
I was just about to tell you that Dr. Randall confirmed that my seed is healthy. Maybe their number is a little less, but they are strong enough to conceive. Ted's help was not needed. On the other hand, you continued to have regular intimate relationships with both him and Arnie, so I guess it doesn't matter. She was on the verge of tears. Please, Scott, let me clarify everything. Let me express how sincerely sorry I am and how terrible I feel. Do you believe you feel worse than I do, Molly? She looked at me with sad eyes and shook her head. Okay, I agreed with a heavy sigh. Come on, explain it. But please spare me the declarations of love. Spare me the excuse that what happened has nothing to do with us. Just don't. But Scott, it wasn't because of us. It was just a stupid idea by Hannah, Amy, and me. We've been doing this since school. This is our little game that has never harmed anyone. Have you played this game with all your previous boyfriends? Almost everyone we've been dating for a long time. My sisters and I have always been inseparable, which, in my opinion, only strengthened our bond. We shared everything from clothes and gossip to friends and even boyfriends. While she continued to talk, I sat in silence, wanting to hear more. I was stunned by her revelation. I wasn't expecting this. When we got married, I thought that everything would change, and for a while it did. Suddenly an idea came to my mind. Did your sisters make love to me while we were dating? Molly's cheeks turned red, confirming my suspicions. I didn't want to do this, especially when things got serious between us, but they insisted. I think I passed the test since you're still here, I said sarcastically. She remained silent. Molly, you don't understand, do you? You used me to have fun with your sisters. You've been sleeping with Arnie for years, not with me, because he was better in bed. Have you ever thought about how this situation affects my emotions? What's so attractive about it? It doesn't really matter. I don't want to listen to your explanations. Her lips twitched. Scott, I understand that this was a mistake, but you have to admit that you had intimate relationships with all three of us. I didn't know about it. Stupid. Don't you understand yet? Even if we were discussing an exchange of partners, which I would never have agreed to, if that had happened, I would have found pleasure and excitement in being with other women. I didn't know it wasn't you, Molly. You've always been the only one for me. Not a new and exciting personality, but the woman I cherished more than anything in the world. My frustration grew as I couldn't understand how she didn't realize the seriousness of her actions and those of her sisters. Look, I explained, it's simple. I was your spouse. You should have put me above everyone else. Our bond should have prevailed over any other relationship, but that didn't happen. You put Hannah and Amy above me. You put making love to Arnie above me. You were even ready to get pregnant by Ted without telling me about it. And now you can have them, but you won't get me. I've reached my limit. Tears were streaming down my face, and I got up to leave the room. She begged, but baby, I don't want them. I don't need my sisters. I need you. I replied, isn't it convenient? After all this, you finally chose me over your sisters. Now the choice is mine, not yours. I decided to leave the woman who deceived and betrayed me, who humiliated me for many years. While she was crying, burying her face in her hands, I did not hesitate to go to the door. It dawned on me that life would be better without her. I started dating Barbara, and on the third date I realized that there were other women who could bring me happiness and satisfaction beyond what Molly or her sisters could offer. Barbara's energy and gratitude were infectious, leading to an unforgettable first night in her bed, which turned into an entire weekend. The passion and fun we shared made me feel refreshed, even though I wasn't sure how things would go next. Our relationship continues to develop. We often meet and spend intimate moments, but without haste and pressure. Barbara's understanding and patience with my current state of confusion is a reassuring confidence that I greatly appreciate. Arnie made the decision to keep Hannah by his side, which did not come as a surprise to him. He knew perfectly well that Hannah preferred him in bed, 
so the news of their relationship didn't hurt him as much as Ted and me. Nevertheless, Arnie still confronted Hannah with the fact that he insisted that she grow her hair long in order to prevent her from changing places with her sisters without his consent. He warned her that if she joked with anyone else again, she would face serious financial consequences. He mentioned that he doesn't mind getting intimate with Amy or Molly sometimes, but only when he wants to, not on their terms. Arnie told me that Hannah looked very upset when he made this remark, but chose not to say anything. He added with a grin that she realized she was walking on thin ice right now. Ted inadvertently found a way to deeply hurt Amy when he got a great job in Chicago and informed her that he would be moving there in three weeks. You have a choice. Come with me and work on our marriage with a psychologist, or stay in Cincinnati with your sisters, he said. Choose. Now Amy is torn between her husband and sisters, feeling trapped and unable to let go of either of them. It's a difficult situation, and it's disappointing. All three of them drove off in different directions. As it turned out later, none of the sisters were able to get pregnant. All three turned out to be infertile, and soon Ted and Arnie abandoned their wives. They, like me, dreamed of a large and strong family. As for Molly, she also failed to come out a second time. Not every man agrees to give up the opportunity to become a happy father. If Molly, Hannah, and Amy hadn't been playing swap games, Ted and Arnie and I would have been looking for other ways to become parents without abandoning our wives, but these three sisters treated us cruelly and now no one needs them. Agnes and I met in the ninth grade and started dating, quickly becoming a strong couple by the tenth grade. Throughout high school, we had an even relationship, culminating in the classic moment of losing our virginity at graduation. After that, we couldn't get enough of each other, using every opportunity for intimacy. By the 11th grade, we had already discussed the possibility of marriage and decided to wait until college to tie the knot. But college seems to have changed, Agnes. In high school, our classmates admitted that Agnes and I had a serious relationship that scared off unwanted attention from guys. But when we went to college, where most of the students were from different places, Agnes stopped being perceived by others as mine. Instead, she began to be perceived as an attractive girl, and she was often approached by guys. Although I knew about it, there was little I could do to prevent it. Agnes and I had different specialties and different schedules, so usually our paths crossed only in the evenings after classes and work. I noticed a change in Agnes's behavior during these meetings. She seemed more flirtatious than usual. More than once I watched her chat and laugh with other guys while I was on the opposite side of the square, unnoticed. It also happened that I caught a glimpse of her in the cafeteria with different guys. Once with one, another time with two. It was only much later that I realized that I had never seen her with other girls, only with guys. At that time I didn't care because we were a couple in love planning to get married. She was a beautiful girl who naturally attracted attention but she always showed me that she was mine, every night when we were together. Years later, after graduating from university, finding a job in our specialty and getting married, we began a happy family life. For almost six years I embodied the image of fat, stupid and happy, until reality hit me like a ton of bricks. An accidental incident at work served as a wake-up call. As I was sitting at my desk, Molly from the post office handed me a stack of documents to look at. Looking through the documents, I couldn't help but wonder why exactly this file related to Wally Bergman's account ended up in my hands. Wally, a man I've known since high school, was put in charge of this account. But having delved into its contents, I soon discovered a significant error that went unnoticed. After a short mental calculation, I realized that the forecasts were not justified by almost three million dollars. When I reached for the calculator to clarify the exact amount, Wally burst into my office in a panic, asking if I had seen the file he needed for a presentation at Apex Group in half an hour. It turned out that the file was at my fingertips, although I didn't know why. Although I reviewed it, I had serious doubts about sending it to Apex. I showed him what I had found. And although I knew it was usually just a figure of speech, 
I could swear his face turned white. Oh my god, Rob, I could have been fired because of this. He quickly took the file from me and hurried to make changes. It was Thursday, and Agnes always stayed late to give out Friday's paycheck. So I stuck to my schedule and went to Bud's bar after work to eat half a kilo of meat and drink a couple of beers. As I was finishing my burger and starting my second beer, Wally came in, noticed me, and took a seat at my table. He asked Sue for a beer and asked her to bring him my bill, saying it was the least he could do after I saved his job. I didn't mind because it wasn't a very large amount. We talked about work for a while and then moved on to topics like you saw and you heard. Suddenly Wally completely changed the subject. I have a question for you, Rob, he said. I know it's none of my business, but you're a good guy and I really like your company. I'm wondering why you tolerate Agnes's behavior. I don't quite understand what you mean. Why are you letting her cheat on you? What do you mean, Wally? He looked at my expression, realized his mistake, and said, Oh, you didn't know. He tried to get up, but I stopped him and insisted that he stay. No, Wally, you can't just hand over the bomb and then try to leave. Sit down and tell me everything. Reluctantly, he sat down and said, I don't really know how to say this, Rob. I encouraged him to be honest and share information. I thought you knew everything, Rob. It's been 10 years, how can you not know? Rob, it surprises me that you don't understand anything. What don't I understand, Wally? That Agnes is a walking girl. I was speechless, unable to digest the information. I'm sorry I spoke up, Rob. I should have kept quiet. I managed to get out of the state of shock and encourage Wally to continue. How did you find out about this and how long ago? I found out about it in my last year of school, and I know because I'm one of the many who was with her. I was completely overwhelmed by the information I received, but at the same time I felt an irresistible desire to learn more. Please start at the beginning, Wally, I begged, and don't miss anything. The story that unfolded in front of me was shocking, not only for its content, but also for the fact that it had been happening for more than 10 years without my knowledge. There wasn't even the slightest hint of it. Next, according to Wally, it was two weeks after graduation when I went to my cousin George's house. As usual, I immediately entered the house and went to George's bedroom, expecting to find him at the computer. But George wasn't at the computer. He was sitting on Agnes. I stood and watched them. They both noticed me, but neither of them told me to leave. I quietly undressed and waited for my turn. George and I took turns studying with Agnes until she finally stopped us. She mentioned that she needed to freshen up before meeting you after her shift at Jessup Market. George and I continued to date Agnes when you were at work, until George began a serious relationship with Melody Martin. She was in an intimate relationship with me for a few weeks, but when I came to her one day she was already infatuated with Mike Bella and Justin Walsh. Without hesitation I joined their escapade. We made fun of her until she had to leave to meet you. I wasn't the only one she shared herself with because she'd had a few boyfriends before. I know you and I were buddies but we weren't particularly close, and our tumultuous teenage years when intercourse was the only thing we could think about. You had something like a relationship, but I didn't think it was too serious. After all, if it was serious, would she sleep with everyone she saw, and nothing changed when we went to college? I remember that she had classes from Monday to Thursday and from Tuesday to Friday, and there were no classes on Wednesdays. The last lesson ended at 2 o'clock in the afternoon on Monday Thursday and at 1 o'clock on Tuesday Friday. I don't remember your schedule. After class, you would go to work, and Agnes would retire somewhere in the bedroom. Wednesday became known as all-day intimacy classes. This routine continued throughout school, regardless of the changing lesson schedule. Agnes always waited with her legs outstretched after class while you were working. This did not happen every day, but rather two or three times a week. Many of us guys were surprised when you and Agnes got married. We thought you knew about her extracurricular activities, but nevertheless, you decided to marry her. Many of us thought that you liked watching your girlfriend when she was with other men. Tyler even suggested that you and Agnes were fond of dating other couples, 
but no one could remember seeing you with another woman, while Agnes was often seen with other men. I didn't even know about it, Wally. There wasn't even a hint. I hate to tell you this, Rob, but you probably didn't know that she regularly spends Thursday nights with Bob and Bill Howard. And on Tuesdays when you're bowling, she goes out with Mark Willard. I do not know who else she spends time with, but I can say for sure that when you are busy with something, Agnes is also busy. I made a conscious decision to stop seeing her when she got married. It's one thing to have a relationship with a single woman, but a relationship with a married one is a completely different story. I do not know what to do or what to say, Wally, but I know I have to act. I finished my beer, stood up, and thanked Wally for the burger and for helping me see things more clearly. As I drove home, Wally's words rang over and over in my head. Can I trust what he told me? Part of me kept saying it couldn't be true, Agnes wouldn't betray me like that. But then, I couldn't get rid of the doubts. Why was Wally lying to me? I had to admit that Wally had no reason to cheat on me. He knew that I would investigate his accusations, and if they turned out to be false, our working relationship would be in jeopardy. If he had lied, further cooperation would have been impossible, and Wally knew it perfectly well. The thought of having to work alongside him, knowing the truth about him and Agnes, was frightening to say the least. Although I knew by myself that in adolescence the temptation to engage in intimacy is very strong, and if a girl who has a boyfriend had offered it to me then, I probably would have agreed. But now, faced with the reality of potentially losing Agnes, I wondered what to do next. Would I have been able to survive a one-night stand or a short-term affair if Agnes had assured me that it wouldn't happen again? Maybe. But a ten-year affair? It was a completely different story. It seemed impossible to imagine a future with Agnes after such a betrayal. I was lying in bed pretending to be asleep when Agnes returned from work. I pretended not to notice the touch of her hand, as I did not want to participate in her harassment. Although I had accepted her caresses in the past, now I realized how awkward I was. The next morning I got up early, made coffee and read the newspaper before Agnes woke up. She asked me, What happened last night? I came home excited and ready but I found that you were already in bed, which was unusual for you, Rob. You explained that you didn't feel well because you ate something and that's why you went to bed early. I hope you're feeling better today. I need you to make up for last night by doing double work today. When I got to work, I called my school friend Felix Mazur, who now worked as a corporate lawyer, to ask him to recommend a lawyer to me. Oh no, he said. What's going on? This revelation shows that my hopes did not match reality. Your search for a divorce lawyer indicates that the relationship between you and Agnes is not what I thought. I thought you had an open marriage given Agnes's actions and your obvious devotion to her. It would seem impossible to be so devoted if you don't accept her behavior. Surprisingly, Felix, I only found out about Agnes's actions yesterday. After a short pause, Felix advised me to contact Tom Sweet and mention his name. I followed his advice and contacted Sweet, who agreed to meet with me at one o'clock in the afternoon. He explained that my divorce options range from a peaceful breakup to a more aggressive approach. In our state, adultery is recognized as a valid reason for divorce, but for this, it is necessary to have concrete evidence. How do I find the necessary evidence? I asked. I asked. Without saying a word, he went to his desk, took out a card and handed it to me. The card read, Gaston Marshall, a private investigator whose office is conveniently located across the street. I can call him and see if he can see you right now, he suggested. Please, I replied. I want to deal with this as soon as possible. While Sweet was on the phone, I told him to start filing for divorce, promising to provide evidence as soon as it was received. Ten minutes later, Gaston Marshall was already discussing our next steps. Unfortunately, I had to maintain the appearance of a normal relationship with Agnes, and not let her know that I was no longer the naive fool she was used to. Marshall said bluntly that to do this, we need to stick to our usual routine, 
no matter how disgusting it may seem. If we usually made love three or four times a week, then I had to continue to initiate it, but without any emotional connection. The goal was simply to satisfy physical desires without breaking Agnes's habits. We want her to remain unaware of the changes in our relationship. Back at my office, I plucked up the courage and called Agnes at work. We usually had dinner on Fridays and had breakfast together on Sundays. When I suggested dinner at the Tricochi restaurant, she agreed. While we were enjoying our meal, I was the veal Marcella and Agnes was Rigatoni. The staff of the Marshall Investigation Department were busy with work. While I was enjoying a sip of Merlot, Marshall's words rang in my head. The desire to look for hidden cameras is quite natural, but resisting this desire is extremely important. If she figures it out, all our work will go down the drain. In addition, it will not be easy to behave at ease in the bedroom especially if you are not naturally sociable. The security system is equipped with sound and motion sensors, so you will be filmed knowing that someone from my staff can see you. Don't let that stop you. There is a switch that can turn off the system while you are at home, but people often forget to turn it on when they leave. I suggest you leave it as it is, and imagine that you are a cheeky celebrity at work shooting a scandalous video. Later, I invited Agnes to have a drink and dance after dinner, but she refused. She insisted on going home so that I could make it up to her for disappointing her the night before. On the way back, she moved closer to me and unbuttoned my trousers. Please drive carefully, my love. Don't run into anything that might make me bite off something important. As much as I hated what Agnes was doing, my body couldn't help but enjoy it. Despite my disgust, I wanted her to continue. After a while we returned home, and Agnes urged me to hurry to the bedroom. I couldn't follow Marshall's advice. There was no way I could pretend to be calm, knowing that the audience could be watching me. The idea that I should behave naturally during intimacy with Agnes seemed to me an impossible task, so I found the switch, as instructed, and turned off the system. Leaving my mobile phone on the car seat, I knew it would serve as a reminder to turn on the system when I left home. I don't know if Agnes noticed, but I didn't make love to her that night. I just did everything according to the instructions. Unfortunately, one round wasn't enough and I had to go through two more before Agnes finally let me rest. I got ready for my daily run in the morning, and Agnes told me she wouldn't be home when I got back. She had an appointment with the hairdresser, which was supposed to keep her busy until about 2 o'clock. I've always wondered why her visits to the hairdresser last so long, from 9 in the morning to 2 in the afternoon. Agnes claimed that it was because she liked to gossip with other clients, and after that she often went to lunch with them. But given the recent revelations, I couldn't help but suspect that she was dating one of her lovers, either before or after the hairstyle. When I was about to leave, I did not forget to turn on the system switch. Although I did not expect anything to happen while jogging, it was important for me to put things in order so that the system would be turned on when I was not at home. The switch controlled only the cameras, as the listening devices and the phone call were always active. After doing my usual five-mile run, I returned home and headed to the basement, where I took out the dictaphones that Marshall had put in the closet above my workbench. I chose the basement as the perfect place because Agnes almost never went down there, especially to my work area. Inside the cabinet there were two receivers, one for listening devices and a phone call, and the other for a DVD recorder, which recorded footage from wireless cameras. When I examined the recorder, my suspicions were confirmed. A voice on the phone announced plans for a secret date. Hello? Good morning, darling. Are we still meeting today? You bet. My wife took the kids to the zoo, so we have until 6 in the evening. You know I can't stay that long. I have to get home by 2. If I'm late, Rob might start to get interested. He's already started asking why I don't come home until 2. Let's skip the appointment with the hairdresser and meet up to get everything done on time. But what am I going to say to Rob when he asks why I've been gone so long and I haven't done my hair? I really want to spend more time with you, but I'll have to be content with what I have. 
I immediately recognized my cousin Lou's voice. Back upstairs I was furious, and I wondered how many more of my relatives she was dealing with. But I managed to calm down by the time Agnes returned home after visiting the hairdresser. An hour later, I pretended to fall down the stairs in the basement and informed her that I had injured my back, possibly pulled a muscle. This excuse would allow me to give up intimacy with her for a few days. The following Monday, I called Agnes at her office and informed her that I would be leaving town on Tuesday and would be out until Friday. It was clear that the trip had not been planned. Although three days could have been wasted, I didn't think so. I usually went once a month, and Agnes was always at home when I contacted her on the phone in the evening. Since my calls were at different times, usually between 7 and 10 o'clock, I doubted that she was waiting for my call to leave later. If she really cheated on me, as I heard, then most likely she did it during our conversation, perhaps even in our bed. At least, that's what I was hoping for. If she changes and the cameras record it, I will have the indisputable proof my lawyer needs for the divorce process. That evening, Agnes expressed a desire for intimacy, but I used my back pain as an excuse to avoid it. When she kissed me goodbye on Tuesday morning with a suitcase in her hand, I left on a business trip. After spending most of the day at work, I returned to our neighborhood and parked a block away from our house. Using my laptop, I entered the code provided by Marshall, which activated the program he had installed on my computer. By pressing a few keys, I was able to listen to the recording of the phone line. Hello? Hello, handsome, it's me. What happened? Hubby just left for a three-day trip. Are you ready to spend three amazing nights with me? I take it as a yes. You're going to call Tony. I have to go to work. I'll be home by six. See you later. After turning off my laptop, I contacted Tom Sweet and instructed him to prepare the necessary papers for delivery by Thursday. I explained to him my special requirements for the assignment. Tom informed me that following my instructions would entail additional costs beyond the standard cost of services, but I insisted that I was willing to pay. Then I left the area and drove to the opposite end of the city, where I stayed in a motel for three days. There was a restaurant and bar next to the motel, which quickly became my favorite place. I found great pleasure in visiting the bar, as it always brought a smile to my face. It was a country western style bar with a jukebox full of tunes that were perfect for dancing. Every evening I noticed several unmarried ladies who were willing to dance with any man sitting alone. On my first visit, I was enjoying a drink at the bar when a stunning red-haired girl approached me. Come on, honey, they're playing our song, she said, took my hand and dragged me to the dance floor. While we were dancing, she made it clear that she had come just for the love of dancing, and not for anything more. Her name was Rhonda, and she and her friends Laura and Shelby invited me to join them at the table after the dance. I danced with them in turn until 10.30 p.m., and then I had to leave. Rhonda mentioned that they often visit this place two or three times a week, and since I'm staying at a nearby motel, I'll probably see them again in the next two nights. The next day at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I parked the car a block away from home and watched the recording made by wireless cameras the night before. The two people who entered Agnes's bedroom were young men, much younger than her. I couldn't help but wonder if Agnes was looking for the energy and vitality of youth. There was nothing unusual about the actions captured on camera, the usual intimacy. But it was unpleasant for me to watch my wife behave in this way. The sight of Agnes having an intimate relationship with two men did not attract my attention. I was intrigued by the sound. To my surprise, there was silence. I half expected Agnes to mock me and my success in bed, but she didn't. The situation was the same as it always was on Wednesdays. The only mention of me was when one of the men expressed a desire to see Agnes more often. In response, Agnes explained that I am a priority when it comes to her time. I learned from Agnes that they need to vacate the premises by 6 in the morning. I knew that none of the neighbors got up early so it was important for them to leave before they were noticed. Both on Wednesday and Thursday morning they left the house at exactly 6 o'clock, so I expected the same thing to happen on Friday. 
I contacted my lawyer and asked him to hand over the documents on Friday. At 5.45 a.m. on Friday, I parked the car next to the house. By 5.55 a.m., the front door opened and two men got out. After saying goodbye to Agnes, who was standing at the door, they noticed a man standing to the side. He went to the open door, handed something to Agnes, and then left, leaving her and her two companions to watch the retreating figure. I honked my horn in front of the house to get Agnes's attention, waved goodbye to her, and drove away. Among the papers handed to her was my letter, saying that I no longer wanted to communicate with her without the presence of our lawyers. I had no desire to understand the reasons for her actions. I didn't want to hear that her love for me was sincere, and communication with other people was meaningless. I refused to listen to explanations that we would be able to survive all this thanks to our love. I was not interested in listening to the typical excuses that cheaters use when they are caught. Despite my feelings, Agnes completely ignored the letter. Fifteen minutes after I drove away from the house, the phone rang. It was Agnes. All her calls went to voicemail. When I arrived at the office, I told the secretary not to take a single tube from Agnes. When I was about to enter my office, I thought about it and turned back to her. And one more thing, Martha. If she comes in, please let her know that I'm not here. Tell them I've gone to meet a client. Five minutes later, Martha poked her head in the door. I talked to Iris at the reception. If your wife shows up, she will warn me and take her place and you will leave through the side door. You can go to the cafe and have a coffee until she leaves. I expressed my gratitude to her, and when she returned to her desk, I couldn't help but think that a competent secretary was truly invaluable. Despite the fact that Agnes called me 17 times that day, I decided not to answer any of her calls. During lunch I called my father and brother to bring them up to date. I asked my father to inform my mother about this, and ask her to refrain from trying to mediate between me and Agnes. It wouldn't have been easy, because my mother saw Agnes as the daughter she never had. By the end of the day, I had unfinished work. Not in a hurry to return home, I decided to stay and finish it. Martha said, I'll leave at five, see you in the morning. In addition, your wife tried to call you five times before noon, but I followed instructions not to transfer her calls. She seemed to understand because she hasn't called back since. My shift ended around seven, and when I entered the course lobby, Iris was already gone, and Hank, our night watchman, was sitting at the reception desk. He greeted me and asked, Are you going to walk around the city on a hot night with your wife? I quickly informed him that my wife and I were getting divorced, and she was waiting outside to talk to me. I asked Hank not to let her in, and to tell her that I was unavailable. I also asked him to tell her that my car is parked because it won't start, and a tow truck will pick it up in the morning. Hank nodded, and assured me that he would handle the situation. I'm very sorry to hear that. Divorces are never easy. I know this from my own experience because I've been through two myself. Trying to avoid unnecessary conversations, I quietly slipped out the back door and headed to Dave's diner. Finding a place where I could watch Agnes waiting for me at the car, I ordered my signature dish and watched her closely while I ate. While enjoying dessert, I noticed how she walked up to the building and pressed the call button on the intercom. Hank must have given her my message, because she went back to her car and drove away. I finished my dessert, drank the last cup of coffee and left too. I stopped by the bar to have a couple of beers, despite the fact that several women were looking for dancing partners, finished their drinks, and left. The next morning turned out to be hectic. I was in a hurry to complete all the tasks that I had neglected before meeting Agnes. I was afraid that I might be late and she would do what I had to do. I went to the bank, emptied all the accounts, took the certificates of deposit and personal documents from the safe, but left Agnes's things. I took off my wedding ring and left it in the safe for her to find. After that, I went to the Waffle Iron for breakfast and used my mobile phone to cancel the joint credit cards. Only Visa and American Express remain in my name. Agnes only had two cards in her name, so I just made sure that she couldn't use them when withdrawing cash. After breakfast, I returned to the motel 
parked the car and called a taxi to the nearest Avis rental point. I rented the cheapest car and returned to the motel. After lunch, I was relaxing by the pool and reading a book. Before dinner, I turned on my cell phone and found nine missed calls from Agnes. I deleted the messages and turned off the phone. After a light dinner I decided to go to the bar, where a live band performed on Friday and Saturday evenings, attracting a large number of people. I managed to find a place at the bar, ordered a beer, and quickly drank half of it before I felt my shirt being pulled. Turning around, I saw Rhonda standing there and inviting me to join her table. She playfully teased me for not noticing her in a crowded bar, but insisted that I join them. I hesitated feeling like I could get in the way, but Rhonda brushed aside my concerns and invited me to sit with them. I got up from my seat and followed her to her table, where I noticed Laura and Shelby were also sitting. After taking a seat, I greeted the girls and couldn't resist making a remark. Something is wrong with this scene. Three gorgeous women at a table alone, and you don't have a crowd of guys around you? Did you have to come for me? This is somehow wrong. The girls nodded in agreement, expressing their disappointment. We do get a lot of attention, but it's usually from jerks. They see us here, notice our wedding rings and think we're looking for an affair. Just three married women who were mistaken for scammers. We're here to dance and have a good time, and unfortunately not many guys understand and appreciate that. Some people think they are irresistible to women and we have to fight them off. But after seeing how you behaved last night, we realize that you are not one of those. We are always glad to see you at our table. Look, I know it's none of my business, but I have to ask, why are three beautiful married women like you spending time here without their husbands? A logical question, Rhonda said. Laura's husband, a reserve soldier, was deployed to Afghanistan, and at home she felt isolated and restless. To overcome her loneliness, we decided to take her outside. Since Shelby's husband worked during the day, and my husband was a trucker, we formed a close-knit group to ensure friendly communication with each other. We were united by a common love of dancing, and we found solace in each other's company. While dancing, we couldn't help but think about your story. We noticed the absence of the ring that adorned your finger the last time we met, and now it's gone. What happened? Yesterday I filed for divorce and took off the ring, leaving it to her as a keepsake. Do you think that gives you the right to hunt? Not at all. The reason for the divorce was adultery, and I'm not going to give her a reason to counterclaim. Great, Laura replied. We have a reliable dance partner. I spent the evening dancing with them and sharing them with other men they agreed to dance with. On Sunday I was relaxing by the pool with a book and on Monday I drove a rented car to work. I was hoping Agnes wouldn't see my car and think I'd left town, which meant she'd stay away. During the week, Agnes called me six to ten times a day, and I ignored all the calls. Twice she tried to call from unfamiliar numbers, but as soon as I heard her voice, I immediately stopped the conversation. Every evening I would definitely go to the bar to have a couple of beers. On Wednesday and Friday, I would find Rhonda, Laura, and Shelby there and join them for a drink. On Wednesday we danced until 10, and on Friday we stayed until closing time. I thought Agnes would realize by Saturday that I wasn't going to talk to her, so I returned the rental car and drove my own to work on Monday. Unfortunately, this decision turned out to be wrong. Leaving the building in the morning, I noticed Agnes's car parked next to mine. When she saw me approaching, she quickly got out of the car and stood at the driver's door of my car. We need to talk, Rob, she insisted. Ignoring her, I tried to open the door, but she blocked my way. Come on, Rob, you have to let me explain everything. I pushed her in the side, causing her to stumble and almost fall. By the time she regained her balance, I was already in the car. I rolled down the window and sternly told her, Agnes, you should go back and carefully read the letter that was attached to the divorce papers. I will only communicate with you in the presence of my lawyer, and even then, we will only discuss the details of our divorce. I don't want a divorce, Rob. And I don't need you, Agnes. It's over. 
Accept it because my decision has already been made. With that, I rolled up the window and drove away, leaving her alone. It became clear to me that Agnes was not going to put up with my refusal to talk to her after I left work on Tuesday. As I was approaching my car, two men grabbed my arms. I recognized them as those who were with Agnes in our bedroom. One of them warned me not to resist, saying that Agnes wanted to talk to me and I was being awkward. But they still insisted that I go with them. Even though I was only a few years older, they called me the old man. Probably when they saw me in a suit and tie with a briefcase in my hands, they decided that I was easy prey. But I knew I could handle them. They didn't expect an old man like me to resist, and I could take them by surprise. It would be easy to take down one, but I was sure I could handle the other one-on-one. -on -one. The commotion will attract attention and interfere with their kidnapping plan. But then I started to doubt. Do I really want to escalate the situation? If Agnes did this, what will she do if I send these two back to her bruised and beaten? Reluctantly, I let them walk me to my car and sat between them, putting my briefcase on my lap as they drove me home. Once inside, they directed me to a chair and made sure I stayed seated. Agnes has made it clear that we are not going to divorce. When I tried to get up, two men forced me back down, warning me to stay put. Agnes said that we would stay married, but there would be some changes in our lifestyle. I apologize for the fact that you had to find out about my health problems, but now that it has become known, we will have to put up with it. You are very dear to me, and I want you to know that I am not going to give up on us. As for health problems, it's a strong attraction to intimacy that I can't handle. I've had it since high school, and it manifested itself when we first began an intimate relationship. Although there are medications to help deal with this, they have undesirable side effects that I don't want to put up with. Besides, I like being like this. I have a strong desire for intimacy, and it is important for you to understand this. I always show you affection and attention. My actions do not cause you any harm. I care deeply about you and pamper you endlessly. If you could satisfy me all the time, I wouldn't be looking for pleasure anywhere else. Unfortunately, this is not the case. I have needs that need to be met, so I share my intimacy with others. It doesn't mean that I love them. I just look at you and always come back to you. That's how it should be. I have drawn up a prenuptial agreement stating that I am allowed to have multiple partners to maintain mental health. If at some point you decide that you can no longer put up with this state of affairs, you agree to leave the marriage without property. What will I get in return, except for the terminated marital rights? You will still have the same loving partner that you have had for the last six years and whom you previously called perfect. Despite my actions, which now cause you concern, you once considered our marriage and life together to be flawless. The only problem is that your ego gets in the way. Someone else is now using what you've always considered exclusively yours. It's important for you to understand that our lives will continue the same as the last six years. This does not mean that you have become less important to me. You are an incredible lover who always leaves me completely satisfied when we are in intimate proximity. But you can't satisfy my needs as often as I require. I'll make a deal with you, Agnes, and I'll sign it if you agree to make some adjustments. What adjustments? Do you refuse to be intimate with me on those days when you are with others and we sleep in different rooms? I can't handle it. I need you to be next to me in bed. Can't you see that I love you and don't want to lose you? It's all right, Agnes. You don't need to change anything. I didn't want to sign your contract anyway. Okay. I'll make the changes and think about how to get it back later. I'll go to the computer, make changes, and come back right away. I struggled to get up from the chair where two men had forced me to sit. I informed them that I needed to go to the bathroom, to which one of them suggested that I just shit my pants. Miss Agnes told you to stay where you are until she lets you get up. A few minutes later she returned, read the document to me, and asked me to sign it. I told her that her friends were preventing me from getting up and she allowed them to let me go. I got up, walked over to her, put my briefcase on the table, and took the pen from her. But instead of signing the document right away, 
I decided to read it first, to make sure it matched what she explained. I grabbed the note, grinned, tore it into pieces, and threw it in her direction. Grabbing my briefcase, I headed for the exit. Agnes's voice rang out, ordering two men to stop me. They rushed towards me, but I quickly turned around and swung the briefcase at the head of the first man. He fell to the ground from the impact. The second man was caught off guard, which allowed me to quickly deal with him as well. I punched him, causing him to stumble backwards, and then kicked him in the groin, causing him to fall. Realizing that I needed to keep them incapacitated, I continued the attack, violently kicking both of them. I alternated blows to their sensitive areas to protect myself, until Agnes finally screamed. Stop, Rob, or I'll use a gun, she threatened, pointing the gun in my direction. I defiantly challenged her. Come on, do it. I took out my mobile phone, dialed the police number, gave my name and address, and informed the operator that my wife had pointed a gun at me and was threatening my life. After receiving instructions from the operator to remain calm and not escalate the situation with my wife, I hung up the phone and sarcastically said, Agnes, thank you for speeding up the divorce process. The divorce will be much faster and easier if you stay in prison. Rob, most likely when the police arrive, they will arrest you. You were furious with jealousy when you found out that your wife was talking to two men, as a result of which you attacked them with physical violence. If there are three witnesses, you will be charged with assault. Agnes, why did you do that? But what about your love for me? Don't worry, Rob. I'll help you. The lawyer won't press charges, and everything will be settled. But let's think about it, Agnes. Hank and Joyce witnessed how these people picked me up and brought me to your house. They will confirm that I was not here of my own free will. They will tell you that you brought me to your house against my will. And when I tried to leave, your companions tried to stop me. When they failed, you pulled out a gun. I can spend the night behind bars, but when my witnesses testify, it will be you who will be behind bars, and I will definitely not bail you out. Let's look at the charges. Kidnapping, unlawful detention, threatening with a weapon, and knowingly false statements to the police. Perhaps there are other charges that you have not considered. Agnes, the most reasonable solution is to remain silent. Despite my advice, Agnes and two of her accomplices lied, and I ended up in prison. In the morning I called that light, informed him about the situation and advised him to contact Gaston Marshall to get the tapes and take the necessary measures. Agnes found out that she would not be able to post bail for me until I appeared before a judge who would set bail, which would not happen until Monday. Fortunately, Tom had a connection with the assistant district attorney, to whom he showed recordings of the incident at the house. The tapes showed Barry and Tony holding me down while Agnes pointed a gun at me, and the assistant district attorney overheard her plan to lie and get her accomplices to do the same. As a result, when Agnes arrived at the courthouse on Monday for a hearing on my bail, she was immediately arrested. Arrest warrants were issued for Barry and Tony, and by evening they were behind bars. I refused to post bail for Agnes, and her parents didn't have the funds to pay for her. Agnes hired a lawyer who informed me that the guarantor wanted me to use my house as collateral. I laughed at this suggestion, and stopped the conversation. I left the motel and returned to my house, where I changed all the locks, because Agnes threatened me with a gun. Tom managed to get a protective order against Agnes. If she somehow managed to escape from prison and got within a thousand feet of me, she was in danger of immediate arrest and returned to custody. Both Barry and Tony decided to cooperate with the authorities and extradite Agnes in exchange for leniency. Agnes insisted that she never intended to harm me, but only tried to protect her friends from my aggressive actions. After reviewing the recordings, the jury concluded that her declarations of love for me indicated that she was most likely telling the truth in an attempt to prevent harm to Barry or Tony. As a result, the threat charge was dropped from her. Despite this, she was found guilty of unlawful detention and making false statements to the police, as well as a number of other minor charges. The judge sentenced her to nine months in the county jail 
and a thousand hours of community service after her release. While she was incarcerated, my divorce went smoothly, and the only thing I lost besides Agnes was 20% of the value of the house. I deposited the money into her bank account and then headed to the bar next to the hotel where I was staying. Fortunately, Rhonda and Shelby were there, and I invited them to celebrate their newfound freedom with me. Laura was absent because her husband had returned from a business trip and she was busy. When I was asked why I wanted to celebrate with them, I simply replied, I want to take a chance. I noticed that Laura and Shelby have rings, but you don't have them on your finger. I don't see any signs that you've ever worn them, so I don't think you've ever had a trucker in your life. Besides, I've always liked attractive redheads. Rhonda giggled and replied, You've got me figured out! I grabbed Rhonda and took her to the dance floor. Pride was born in my heart when I saw my daughter rounding second base. But my excitement quickly turned to worry when the outfielder got tangled in the ball and threw it back into the field. Despite the proximity to the target, Brooke did not hesitate to rush to third base, almost catching a throw from left field. I held my breath, knowing that I had repeatedly reminded her to avoid the first or last out in the inning at third base. The fans on our side of the field let out a collective sigh. In the bottom of the ninth inning of the district championship game, the score was even. In the second overtime, Brooks' early triple gave her team hope. As a lifelong baseball fan, I have never felt such excitement and nervous tension as I did at that moment. My daughter was determined to win, even if she had to carry the team on her back. The next batter hit the ball from three pitches, which further increased the tension in the game. At that point, we had a runner on third base with one out. The next player hit the ball towards the third baseman, who played quickly. The third baseman, an experienced player, noticed how Brooke was returning to base, and with a little effort threw the ball to first base. Meanwhile, Brooke was running to her home plate. I was speechless, feeling a lump the size of an apple in my throat. Time seemed to slow down when the first baseman caught the ball and passed it to the catcher. When the catcher picked up the ball, Brooke slid to the back of the court. The moment was painfully close. The crowd held its breath waiting for the judge's decision. Time seemed to drag on endlessly, until finally he made a movement with outstretched arms, palms facing the ground. Chaos ensued, and tears flowed down my face. I watched as Brooke's teammates pushed her from behind, wrapping her in a tight hug. I was overcome with sympathy for the opposing team, which fought valiantly. In the end, only one team can become the winner. This is the harsh reality that accompanies the game. Sitting in the car and watching Brooke stroll through the parking lot with her teammates, her laughter and jokes filling the air, I couldn't help but marvel at her beauty, intelligence, and athleticism. I felt like I was being overwhelmed by a wave of love for this amazing girl. Hi, Daddy. Brooke greeted, climbing into the passenger seat. How did you like the game? I chuckled when she mentioned playing third base. Brooke, there are certain truths in baseball that always stand. It's just one of those things. I replied, I didn't make it up, but it's a fact. Then she asked, What about the fact that my arm hurts, and I don't think I can hit another batter, let alone another inning? Realizing the urgency of the situation, I knew that we had to act in this inning or face serious consequences. We'd better put ice on today, Brooks, I advised. Surprised by her pain, I asked, I didn't know your arm hurt. Did you tell the coach? No, Dad. That would put her in a difficult position. She would have to pull me out and she would have no one to put on. Nancy is suffering from a sprained ankle and Stephanie has the flu. Despite their setbacks, Brooke enthusiastically announced that we would be heading to the States next week. This news was a welcome change from thinking that the season was coming to an end. Looking at the child sitting next to me, who used to be under my care, I couldn't help but be amazed. I remember changing her diapers, teaching her how to ride a bike, throw, catch, and hit. Now she is the star of her school. She led them to victory in the district competitions and got a place in the States. 
I couldn't help but feel proud, knowing that I had played an important role in her success in school and sports. Daddy, where are we going? Brooke asked as we passed the turnoff on Highway 6. We're going to celebrate our victory in the neighborhood, honey, I replied. I heard that the new Hilton Hotel in Wilkes Bar has one of the best restaurants in the area. I think we both deserve a hearty dinner, a big steak with baked potatoes for me, and a lobster for you. Brooke laughed. Dad, you're the one who likes steak and potatoes. I'll order a lobster, and maybe you should wash down your steak with a mug of Frosty MGD. Dad, that's a great idea. Brooke laughed. After your suggestion, Brooke, I'm thinking about it. You're brilliant. Yes, I'm aware. The idea of recycling these beer cans has been stuck in my head for a long time, Dad. You'd have to be a fool not to understand your preferences. You're not as unique as you think you are, Brooke joked. When we entered the restaurant, there was already a queue of people waiting for a table, which stretched for ten minutes. I was given a device that lights up and vibrates when it's my turn. While Brooke went to the ladies' room, I settled down on the next bench. It wasn't until she returned about five minutes later that I realized tears were running down her cheeks. Worried, I asked, Brooke, what happened? Does your arm hurt? What's the matter, honey? Sobbing, she explained, You know mom couldn't come to my game because she had to go to Philadelphia for work, right? And then everything became clear. Brooke, I understand that your mom has a difficult job at an insurance company, and she has to travel a lot. She really wanted to attend your game, but her busy schedule doesn't allow it. Don't worry, honey, most likely she will be able to come to the States soon. But Brooke screamed, I don't care if she ever comes to my game, let her go straight to hell. I was shocked. Brooke never spoke ill of her mother or used such expressions, although she sometimes heard them from me. Her sudden outburst was shocking to me. Daddy, you're as blind as I am, she added. But mom didn't go to Philadelphia, but is inside with a man, holding hands and laughing. It was a shock to see my wife, Brooke's mother, getting involved with another man. I felt a wave of dizziness wash over me. Brooke hugged me tightly, and tears streamed down our faces. How could such a happy day turn into a nightmare so quickly? I managed to pull myself together and return the vibrating alarm to the waitress, after which I calmed Brooke down and led her to the car. I helped her into the car and got behind the wheel, unable to start it as my vision was blurred by tears. We sat in silence in the parking lot for an eternity until the emotions of nausea, shame, and fear began to subside. I wiped my eyes and tried to focus, quietly asking Brooke if she was sure it was her mother. Maybe it was a misunderstanding, I suggested, trying to calm her down. It could have been someone who just looks like Natalie. Maybe that's what you saw. That's right, Dad. What? I do not know what my own mother looks like. There should be several thousand purple Lexus SUVs with license plates bearing Nat's last name. Like that one over there? I must have imagined it. Brooke screamed. I looked in the direction she pointed and saw Natalie's car a few rows ahead of where we were sitting. It was impossible to make a mistake. I'm sorry, Brooke. I guess I was just trying to deny that this could happen to me. With us, I apologized. It's clear that your mother is at the hotel. She deceived both of us and is unfaithful to me. We need to recognize this reality and decide what to do next. At that moment, my phone rang. I already knew who it was even before I looked at the screen Natalie. I didn't want her to know that Brooke and I had found out her location and actions. I needed time to plan our next steps. Hi, Natalie, I replied as calmly as possible. Hi, honey, Natalie chirped. How was the game? I'm dying to know who won. We managed to snatch a victory, and now we're going to the States next week. I have to admit, Brooke has really improved her game. Can you give her the phone, dear? I want to congratulate her and let her know how proud I am of her. I wish I could be there, Natalie lied. She's with her teammates right now, Natalie. I will definitely pass on the message, I assured her. Are you in Philadelphia now? I asked. Yes, I'm driving down Broad Street now, Natalie chuckled. The traffic is pretty slow, so I decided to call you and find out how it went. Just be careful in this new car, Natalie, 
You drive your Lexus, right? I asked. Of course, Tim. I love this car. It's incredibly safe and doesn't consume as much gasoline as your Ford, she teased. Well, I have to go, Tim. I'm almost at the hotel. I love you and I'll call you again tomorrow, she promised before hanging up. I glanced at Brooke, who seemed to be on edge, but then she snorted and smiled at me. Who needs this woman, really, Dad? Brooke asked, not expecting an answer. We can live better without her. We just need to clean our tongue, I reminded her. I raised you better than that, I scolded gently. I'm sorry, I was just angry, Brooke admitted. I feel better now, but I'm worried about you, Dad. At first I thought that my game was insignificant to her. Instead of supporting me at the county championship, she chose to sneak off with someone else. Until that moment, I hadn't thought about how hurtful her act was. It really hurts. I'm at a loss what to do next. Betrayal overwhelms me, and I can't think clearly. Dad, would you really tolerate her disrespecting us? I think you would have thrown her out the door quickly. Her disrespect for you and me is unacceptable. Do you think this lie will be enough to file for divorce from her, even without a boyfriend? Brooke asked. It seems so, I replied, but over the years I've learned that it's better to think carefully before acting hastily. I can always file for divorce later if necessary. Hey dad, do you have a spare key for mom's car? Brooke asked. Yes, but why do you need it? I asked. I think this could be the last piece of evidence proving where mom is, Brooke explained. I handed Brooke the key and watched her walk to Natalie's car. She pressed the key fob button and the headlights blinked, confirming her suspicions. Without hesitation, Brooke got into the car and drove away. I quickly started my car and followed her. It wasn't long before she pulled into the parking lot of the Best Western Hotel, where she waved at me from the driver's seat. When she reached the back corner, she jumped out and walked over to my car. She pressed the button to lock Natalie's car and then got in next to me. This is just a glimpse of what mom's life will be like, the daughter scoffed. Just think when she won't be able to find her car. She won't be able to claim she was stolen in Philadelphia. Her story will unravel when she is questioned by the police. If she reports the theft here, she'll have to explain why the car was here when she said she took it to Philadelphia. Lying only makes things more difficult. I was torn between feeling proud of Brooke's brilliant idea and wanting to make an appointment with a psychiatrist. The idea of Natalie getting a lesson about the consequences of lying appealed to me more and more as I thought about it. After stopping at Burger King for fries and a hamburger, we headed home, where Brooke started asking thought-provoking questions. One of them sounded like this. How long do you think Mom has been cheating on you, Dad? Do you think she has a lot of experience in this matter? What do you think motivates her to do this? Is she too obsessed with the desire to engage in intimacy or something else? What is your relationship with her in this regard? Brooke, I've been thinking about this. She's been very attentive to my bedroom needs lately, which I can't complain about. I have no idea about the frequency and duration. I've never considered her particularly promiscuous, I confessed. It never occurred to me that anything could be wrong. I suspect it started when she started acting seductively towards you. Women sometimes do this to alleviate their guilt. When did she start? Brooke asked. Probably around Christmas. I thought everything had been going well for the last five months. Natalie was more distant than usual, but she seemed eager to make things right, I admitted. It seemed natural to discuss such personal issues with my daughter. We've always been close, and it's only brought us closer. Despite the fact that she was only 17 years old, Brooke showed a level of maturity that was impressive. In our house, talking about sex life has never been forbidden. Both Natalie and I believed in being transparent and candid when talking to Brooke about this topic. Our goal was to tell her about the potential risks and consequences of having sex at a young age. Brooke even reminded us of the importance of regular checkups and the potential risk of sexually transmitted diseases, noting that you can never be sure about a person's sexual history. If you plan to continue sleeping with your mom, you should consider buying contraception. Brooke, 
I don't want to buy them, as it might arouse suspicion. Your mom may act like an ignoramus but she's not stupid, I said. I can't continue to have an intimate relationship with her. I'll get checked out and figure out how to keep your mom busy while I decide what to do next. Dad, please take care of yourself because I will need you more than ever. Brooke was firm in her decision to move in with me if I decided to divorce her mother. She expressed confidence that our marriage would end in divorce, despite my hope that Natalie and I would be able to establish a relationship. Brooke understood my gentle and kind nature, but she also knew that it would be difficult for me to accept the truth about her mother's lies, even beyond the question of infidelity. She predicted that it was only a matter of time before I came to terms with the fact that her mother had left me. I was thinking about how many other men are in the same position as you, Dad. Over the years, countless people have been lucky to have an intelligent daughter with whom to have meaningful conversations. For me, Brooke has become such a person. She kept me from breaking down, encouraging me to approach situations with logic rather than emotion. She always put my well-being first, and never had any ulterior motives. Could anyone has wished for a better confidant? The next day, I made an appointment with a doctor. Later, after work, I went to school to pick up Brooke after practice. Arriving a little earlier, I watched the girls during training. Other parents showered Brooke with compliments for her performance in the last game. Although I felt proud of her achievements, it only highlighted the dissatisfaction I felt in my marriage. Natalie appeared at the door around seven, and no matter how hard I tried to greet her with my usual warmth, it looked forced and insincere. I wondered if Natalie would pick up on my concern, but she quickly dispelled all doubts. I've missed you so much, Tim, she exclaimed. I'll show you how much later. Then she casually asked if I had a spare key to her car. Of course, I replied, taking the key out of my pocket and handing it to her. Did you lose yours? I asked. Natalie quickly replied, No, otherwise I wouldn't have been able to get home, right? She explained that she needed a spare key in case she lost hers. I nodded understandingly and handed her the key. It looked like she had found her car, but now she was careful about how it was moved. As if on time, Brooke came into the room and asked, Hi mom, how's Philadelphia? Did you have a good time? Brooke was surprised at how much fun she was having. These meetings are long and difficult, Natalie said. They're not funny. Okay mom, it's long and hard but not fun, I get it, Brooke replied. Why do you keep working if it's so hard? What is it? she asked. Dad earns well and you're smart. You could find something to do that will give you more free time to spend with us. Most of the time I love my job, Natalie explained. And besides, I won't always spend that much time traveling. I think everything will settle down by the end of the year. After that, I'll have a lot of time to spend with you. Just wait and see. Natalie carried her small suitcase into the bedroom and closed the door. Brooke invited me into the kitchen. Did you hear that, Dad? It looks like her partner will move out by the end of the year, and then you can leave your mom. How do you like it? Lies and potential sexually transmitted diseases for another six months, and then it's all over, unless of course she finds someone else. Can you handle it? Brooke asked. I told Brooke that she understood too much from one sentence. What she said may not be the whole truth. I grew up next to you and I know how you think. Brooke claimed that mom thinks she can have an affair and next year everything will go back to normal and no one will get hurt. I did not agree, saying that I would not be able to live a day in this situation because it was too much stress for me. Dad, the situation won't change until you act. Such problems do not disappear on their own. That evening I told Natalie that my back and head hurt. Despite this, she still wanted to help, even offered to make love. It took me a lot of work to convince her otherwise. It's a shame when you have to reject the courtship of your own wife. This is the reality of my life. The next evening as I watched Brooke's team finish training, I couldn't help but notice that some of the girls' mothers were more sociable than usual. Brooke noticed it too and mentioned it when we were returning home. Daddy? 
Did I really see Emily's mom holding your hand and leaning towards you while talking to you? What is it? She asked. It seemed to me that she was deliberately pressing her breasts against your arm. Then Brooke noticed how Mrs. Thomas offered me a sip of her soda, which further confirmed her suspicions. It looks like you've suddenly caught the attention of the parents of the softball players. I must admit it seemed strange to me too. I couldn't get rid of the feeling that these women were being too friendly for some reason. Maybe they see you as potential prey, since you're about to become a bachelor, suggested Brooke. What do you mean, Brooke? They have no idea that I'm going to be a bachelor soon, and I doubt very much that there is a lot of demand for me, I replied. And then Brooke gave out a sensation. Last night in the locker room, she told her teammates that her mom was cheating on me. Emily and Steph, whose fathers have left their mothers in recent years, obviously considered me as a potential stepfather. Their mothers seemed to agree with this. I was stunned by Brooke's revelation. Why did you share such personal information with them? I asked. Not everyone needs to know about our personal lives. I feel extremely uncomfortable about this situation. Dad, have you thought about what other people might already know? Wouldn't it be even more shameful not to notice what everyone else knows? The girls already know about it. Trudy's mom saw your wife and another man enter the hotel room during a conference a few weeks ago. The only change is that other moms know that Trudy's mom knows about infidelity, so it won't seem like they're the only ones to blame for the breakup of our family. It's time to admit that our family is already in a pretty deplorable state. Brooke thought about it, calculating how many times it takes to shock a person in order for this to become the norm. The realization that others know that I am a cuckold has only increased the feeling of hopelessness. Any remnants of pride were completely destroyed. After the events of this week, nothing could confuse me anymore. And then new revelations followed. Sarah has been complaining about her father's absence from home since the winter. She recently announced that they would be moving after Thanksgiving, as her father's insurance company was moving him to a new location. Last night, Trudy's mother saw Sarah's father picking her up after training. To her surprise, she recognized him as the man who had been involved with her own mother. Curious and suspicious, I walked Sarah to her car tonight to confirm my suspicions. It turned out that this was indeed the same person I saw with her mother that evening. The revelation made me feel dizzy and dazed. How could children reveal so much? Was it all just a coincidence? Or do our children really know us better than we think? Why did I ponder these questions if the answers could be easily found just by asking Brooke? What am I supposed to do now, Brooke? I don't think I can think straight anymore. Well, Dad, I'm glad you asked, Brooke replied. I knew you'd get the attention of most soccer and softball moms. Today they confirmed it for sure. You should not tolerate a woman who lies and cheats. You deserve better, and I'm going to help you find it. But first, you need to let go of what's holding you back. It was the night before Brooke's first state championship playoff game, and Natalie had to leave for another business trip. She assured Brooke that, if necessary, she would drive all day to get back in time for the start of the game. This last lie helped ease our guilt. There was a knock on the door and a bottle of champagne was brought to the room. I convinced the staff that the couple from room 402 are our close friends, and we want to surprise them. It all sounded very friendly and loving. When the door opened, I slipped a $20 bill into the guy's shirt pocket, took the champagne and squeezed into the room. Brooke, Sarah and Sarah's mom followed me into the room. Natalie was lying in bed, pressed tightly against the sheet. The asshole was wearing a bathrobe and looked puzzled. I started. I'm sorry to distract you from your studies, but Sarah and Brooke wanted to celebrate their victory in the district with all the parents. It looks like you both missed Sarah and Brooke's incredible performances. Sarah hit a two-run home run in the bottom of the seventh to tie the score, and then made the decisive save in the eighth inning, and Brooke had one hitter, made a triple, and scored the winning goal in the ninth game. Imagine the enormous pride Susan and I feel for our daughters, 
and then try to figure out what you missed. The truth is that you can't fully understand because you weren't there. Susan raised four glasses, and I poured champagne into each of them. I managed to open the bottle just in time before room service was interrupted. I handed the glasses to Natalie and this asshole to drink to the truth and the achievements of our daughters. To the new journey our lives are embarking on. Let's drink to Sarah and her mom staying put this fall. Let's drink to smart kids and experienced lawyers. Susan, Sarah's mom and I enjoyed sparkling wine while the girls drank soda. Steve, there's no need to go home. Sarah and I will be fine without you. My lawyer assured me that I would be able to keep the house and live comfortably. Sarah won't have to change schools again. You can stay with your mistress, so I'd say it's a fair deal, Susan said with a forced smile. Natalie screamed in shock. I love you both. Please don't make any sudden decisions. It's not what it seems, I begged. Natalie's answer brought me some relief. I'm glad to hear that, I said, because it looks like you're lying in bed with this jerk and you're naked. I couldn't figure out what I was seeing. But Brooke tried to defuse the situation. Look at it this way, Mom, she added. You won't have to come up with excuses to skip my events anymore. You can be with anyone you want without feeling guilty. And you don't have to worry about infecting Dad with a sexually transmitted disease. You'll never have to watch him devastate when he finds out he's been betrayed. I know we both want the best for Dad, for him to finally find happiness. And I believe that he will be happy now. Thank you for everything, Mom. But please don't attend any events that I participate in, so as not to get into an awkward position. As the four of us left, Natalie couldn't help but cry softly. As we expected, Natalie contracted a sexually transmitted disease, because as it turned out later, Steve was a lover of corrupt love and at the same time did not like to protect himself. I hope this was a lesson for Natalie.